Now, be before we get underway with the uh, introduction by Andrew Steves, I just wanted to take an opportunity to talk to people about the Opulent Society. Uh, the registration today, I noticed uh, a lot of a lot of new names, so we'll take this opportunity. My name is Spencer Stewart, and uh, I'm the chair of the Opulent Society. And the Opulent Society itself was founded in 1965, and it's the only nonprofit organization in Canada that's dedicated to the entire range of interests relating to books and reading. Now we achieve this through a variety of different ways. One of, it, one of which is our publication, uh, M4, which is published three times a year. It covers a whole variety of topics from authorship to publishing, book design, typography, book selling, you name it. And uh, we also have an archive of uh, past editions uh, at the SFU archives, which is accessible online. We also uh, engage with our membership and people interested in, uh, in the history of books and book design through, our, uh, through events such as the one that you're attending tonight, as well as exhibitions at a variety of different uh, libraries and institutions across the country. Now, uh, some of the members may have already received the uh, catalog connected to the book awards. This is another way in which we uh, raise awareness for book design in Canada. And the Alcuin Society Annual Awards, um, they are the only, only sort of national competition of its kind that recognizes and celebrates uh, the art of the book in Canada. And the winners of which go on to represent uh, the nation in international competitions in both Frankfurt uh, and Leipzig. Uh, this, this evening, you know, if, this is, if you are not a member of the Alcuin Society, encourage you to have a look at our, our site and follow the various links uh, and see if you want to get involved. Uh, it's certainly a, a lively group of people engaged with a whole variety of different topics connected to book history and book design. Uh, this evening could not have happened without the program's uh, chair of the Alcuin Society, Gina Page, uh, and, and all of the efforts that she does through the year to put together events such as this. So with that, I will hand it over to Andrew to make introductions for Richard Kegler. And what we'll be doing is at the end of the talk, we'll address questions. But if you have any questions, please type them in the chat and we'll make sure that we get to them. Uh, and also make sure that uh, this, is a, this is being recorded. So if you want to return to it later on, you're more than welcome. We'll be uploading it onto our YouTube site. So with that, I will pass it over to Andrew, in one moment. And off you go. You're ready. <laughs> Thanks, Spencer. Uh, well, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm delighted that you're here, wherever you are. And uh, uh, it's always kind of a folly to uh, ask me to give an introduction, because I'm, uh, you know, I've read a lot of literary readings over the years. And I don't think any of my authors have ever gotten a proper introduction. So it's, it, this is kind of my classic Sene Pan pipe uh, introduction. <laughs> anyway, but, uh, um, but I can tell you about Rich. I mean, if you want to know the details of his, you know, his social security number and whatnot, just go on the internet. It's all out there somewhere. Uh, but what, what I can tell you about Rich that I think is germane today is that, uh, I'm very fond of him as a, as a human being and uh, as an artist. Uh, we met, oh, about 2011, just after he completed, and probably just after he'd released his, his film on Jim Rimmer, Making Faces. And Richard had driven up to Canada to uh, Niagara and the Lake to where I was giving a talk at a school for architecture, strange as that was, uh, about, you know, working with, uh, antiquated tools to make modern things. And anyway, we got to talking after that and hit it off. And we had a lot of acquaintances in common. Uh, Jim Rimmer, you know, not the least of them. And so we, we've, our friendship started there. And one of the, I think, important things that you should know about Rich is that he is evidently a skilled and invent, inventive and playful printer. Uh, the work he does is really quite fabulous. And I hope that you know, at some point you have a chance to see some of his work in, in person. Um, the other thing that, you know, Rich really has excelled at throughout his career is 
you know, as a marketer and as an entrepreneur, he started uh, P22 selling digital fonts, you know, back in the uh, mid nineties and really did quite a business selling primarily, I think, uh, his most original work was found fonts, things like handwriting and, you know, uh, this kind of thing. And, um, you know, that that entrepreneurial uh, bent has carried on now under a new company called Dry Inc., which sort of demonstrates also his quirky sense of humor. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that you'll discover about, about Rich, if you sort of look at his career, is that, you know, there's the core objects that he's you know uh, marketing and selling and then there's a lot of sort of peripheral activity a lot of mugs and rulers and aprons and this and that and i have to say that he uh, in, my, in my view he takes as much joy in you know selling you a thimble as he does in selling you a loom um the other thing that you know i think you need to know what rich is that he's quite a a skilled teacher and a, a passionate community organizer uh, he was instrumental, uh, you know, in getting the Western New York Book Arts Collective going back in the early 2000s. And he did a, a stint at Wells College at their, in their book arts program. And, and he's continued that kind of community um, activity on with his sort of volunteer work with the, at the foundry of uh, Michael Winnie Bixler. So, you know, being uh, involved in more than just making and selling things, but you know, helping helping other people has been a big part of, of his show. And so I'd say at heart that, you know, one of the things that, that Rich is is just passionate. He's just uh, enamored with the floats and the jetsam of 20th century uh, graphic culture. He's an enthusiast. Uh, he's also, I think, very interested in that place where people and technology intersect. There are lots of people who can run machines and there's lots of people who can sell things and, and, and organize, but people who can kind of do both are kind of rare. And, I, and I'm, I'm just grateful that Rich is out there bringing those things together. He's a, so he's a community builder, I think is what I'm trying to say there. Anyway, you know, on a personal note, I'd say that our, our time, you know, here is alive is always too short. And it's so important to find the good people who are creative and working hard and compassionate. And uh, Rich is one of those people. And I'm just so grateful to be a part of his world. And I'm glad that you'll get a little peek into it tonight. So without further ado, Richard Kegler. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. That was uh, kind of fantastic. I, good thing we recorded it. I can use that for other things. Thanks. Um, so uh, thank you to Andrew, thank you to the Alcuin Society and everyone who's here to uh, see my presentation. So I, I guess we'll get right to it and um, then we'll have questions afterwards. So let's share the screen. All right. So yeah. hello. And again, thank you, Andrew, for that introduction. It was, I'm gushing, that's great. Uh, so this talk is entitled uh, Metal Type in the 21st Century. Century, and it's intended to be a look at the state of metal type casting from my personal perspective. It may have more than a few gaps in the current scene. It, it may be a stretch to call it a scene, as typecasting is generally a very solitary endeavor. And while it may be safe to say there's thousands of letterpress printers active today, the number of people casting type in any form may be in the hundreds. The number of people cutting and casting new designs may be countable on one or two hands. It's worth noting that learning the art of typecasting was traditionally through a guild system with proprietary knowledge not intended for the outside world. There are no comprehensive guidebooks or manuals on the finer points of metal type making, and there's a long history of type and design and typecasting. But it, as the title states, I'm skipping ahead to the 21st century with just a brief introduction to some technology. There are a few people such as Stan Nelson, the former keeper of graphic arts collection at Smithsonian, who continue the art of hand cutting punches and casting with a hand mold. This is type technology from the 15th century. The steps you see here are essentially the same as what Gutenberg may have used. A punch is cut in hardened steel. That punch is driven into a softer brass matrix. The matrix or mat is smoothed out and inserted into a hand mold and molten type metal is poured into the mold and you get a piece of cast type. 
Now repeat that a few thousand times with a few hundred different matrices and you have a full font. The machines used in most typecasting done today were invented in the 19th century. There were typecasting machines that were purpose-built for type foundries. The barth casters and European-made foundry machines were not something normal printers had access to, and a surprising number still survive. That's still a small number, but it's, it's amazing that some of these still do survive. Machines that were, let's say, prosumer level, that are still used by typecasters and printers, were the monotype system, the linotype, and the Ludlow typograph. These are all intended to be machines that would be on site in a printing plant to supply fresh type as needed, rather than order from a, a foundry. The monotype system you see here, introduced in 1885, uh, as the name implies, there was one piece of type cast for each letter. The keyboard and composition caster each perform a complex set of tasks to produce well-considered typography suited to fine press and bookwork. We'll see the monotype a bit more later in the presentation, but just to give you an idea of how it works, the specialized keyboard punches holes into a tape, and that tape is then transferred to the composition caster, where compressed air triggers the holes to align and cast specific character. And then it's moved to the next one, all in basically about one second. The linotype, introduced a year later than the monotype, 1886, as the name implies, is cast type on a line of type. The complexity of this machine boggles the mind to see an operation. Linotypes were popular among newspapers, and you may still find one in shops such as Gasparo Press for letterpress projects. Uh, as you saw, Andrew, there's one right behind him. The third in-house type system uh, is the Ludlow typograph. It may be the most approachable of the three, as it is smaller and simpler to use. A specialized composing stick holds the mats, similar in a way to the, a line of type might be set in a composing stick. A solid line is cast similar to the line of type method. Uh, this was commonly used for newspaper headlines and general larger type sizes. Some of the level of type designs are quite nice. What you see there is basically the size of a small desk with a chest of drawers next to it. And uh, the big difference uh, is from, a, let's say, a laptop computer is this can squirt hot metal at you. Um, each of these systems have recently had uh, uh, monographs, uh, publications that were introduced in the last few years by Rich Hopkins and, and uh, Frank Romano, and are really worth seeking out to uh, understand how these machines work and their importance in printing history. My introduction to metal type came via letterpress shops that I was fortunate enough to have wandered into and have been welcomed into. The most significant was Paradise Press in Buffalo, New York. For the previous 28 years, I was lead designer and director of P22 Type Foundry. P22 is a digital type design house that started out by digitizing lost historical letter forms and creating digital fonts. The name Foundry was tongue in cheek. In 1994, not too many type houses used the term Type Foundry. In the current graphic design world, the term almost always evokes a digital type house. These are digital fonts from P22, packaged on floppy disks. This is what the natural font of metal type really looks like. When I learned how type metal or metal type was made, it seemed so daunting and unlikely that anybody would still be making metal type. Over the years, I've gravitated towards the analog and physical aspects of typography and printing and less involvement with digital type. As of the end of 2021, I'm no longer in the digital type business. I'm not exactly in the metal type business either, but this talk will give you some idea of my travels into the world of metal type. Through a series of events related to digital type mergers and acquisitions, I was introduced to this man. I don't really think Jim Rimmer needs an introduction to this group, but just in case anyone watching this is not quite sure who he is, Jim Rimmer was a multifaceted graphic artist based in New Westminster, British Columbia. He was awarded the Robert R. Reed Award for Lifetime Achievement by the Alcuin Society. More importantly, he was a generous and talented soul who took the time to share his knowledge with anyone who asked. He cast a long shadow that has inspired more people than he would have ever imagined. As a thank you for Jim for my help in working out some business arrangements with him on a personal book project, Jim cast up a quantity of P22 logo ornaments. This to me was mind blowing. I can't tell you how happy this made me. He later presented me with the Bristol patterns, board patterns used to make that ornament. 
And this led to a subsequent visit where I was mentored through the process of making a cast type ornament. The design was made to announce a type conference in Buffalo, New York. I arrived early in the day. The Bristol pattern was hand cut and then reduced with a panographic router to cut a brass pattern. That pattern was reduced again to cut a brass matrix. And this was then used to cast about 524 point ornaments. Not too long after that, in early 20, uh, well, 2008, I suggested to Jim that perhaps we might make a font that could be released both in metal and digital. Oh, I think we lost the slide, that's okay. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, the, the digital and metal formats uh, was never released simultaneously. And Jim was enthusiastic about a new design he was working on and agreed to the idea. Realizing this is a great opportunity to record the process for posterity, Jim agreed to host me for a week and allowed me to videotape and interview him. I traveled with Brian Maloney and Anna Pryor who assisted me for the week. And I took the series of amazing, amazing photos that you see here. Um, the end result was the documentary film, Making Faces. Uh, the film has been screened around the world and has been subtitled for 10 languages. Over the years, I've had many people mention that this film inspired them to try their hand at metal type design and casting. Sadly, Jim passed away before the film was finished. Some of Jim's legacy survives directly with people who have inherited his equipment. While most of Jim's archive is in the Simon Fraser University archives, his machinery has found homes with active caretakers. Jason Duenitz of Graydon Boathouse Press has acquired Jim's type cutting and casting equipment. His recent developments include trial casting and proofing of his Orphe typeface. Jim's friend, Alex Wyden, has kept more of Jim's legacy alive through a limited recasting of Jim's early metal designs, Nephi Medieval, Juliana Old Style, and Fellowship. The fellowship type was named for the American Typecasting Fellowship, or ATF, which still exists to this day. ATF are also the initials for the American Type Founders Company and, and the curious US government agency, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. The last one we don't need to worry about. Uh, Jim regularly credited and referenced Paul Hayden Dunsing as being the person who mentored him the most. Dunsing was one of the founding members of the ATF. Dunsing, like Jim Rimmer, was very generous with his knowledge. He published extensively and set the stage for much of the original type design and casting that has happened subsequently. As with many fine crafts, it takes a mentor-apprenticeship relationship to pass the depth of knowledge and detail involved in these crafts. I never met Paul Dunsing, but I feel I know much more about him because of Jim. His matrix cutting include original designs, extensions to existing faces, and historical revivals. One of the other ATF founders is Rich Hopkins of Terra Alta, West Virginia. The ATF continues largely because of the efforts of Rich Hopkins. Rich has also opened his studio up to interested parties to attend his monotype university, an occasional residency where people who want to commit to acquiring a typecaster are welcome to learn as much as they can be taught in a week. Rich has published the ATF newsletter and guided the biannual conferences to fruition. The ATF will be having the next gathering in May, Maine, the state of Maine in April of 2023. This event usually happens every other year somewhere in the US. Uh, I would suggest anyone interested in learning about typecasting from others who are enthusiastic about the craft and more importantly, in-person interactions to answer questions are, are encouraged to attend. Another important figure in the current typecasting scene is Ed Rayer. Ed's the proprietor of Swamp Press. Aside from taking orders for monotype fonts and casting type, Ed has helped launch a resurgence of new original designs being cut for himself and other clients. He has in the last few years cut many matrices and designs for Patrick Ray. He's also cut mats for new designs such as these, Michael Vicky, Jerry Kelly, Barbara Henry, Russell Moret, and others. These are just a few that you can see on Ed's website. The collaboration between Jen Farrell at Starshape Press and Three Ton Bridge Project produced these Chicago ornaments with mats cut by Ed Rayer and cast at the Bixler Foundry. Val Lucas of Bauer Box Press in Maryland is mentored by Jim Walzak in Massachusetts. He's taken the entire process in-house. They've used the pantograph that once was owned by Paul Dunsing, 
uh, using a process similar to what's shown in the Jim Rimmer film. Vail has so far completed three different sets of ornaments, all the way from the sketch phase to the mat cutting to the casting. You can uh, you check out her website. There's a lot of links at the end of this talk, by the way. So um, again, we'll recap that. In Austin, Texas, letterpress printer Bradley Hutchinson has worked, worked on casting Victor Hammer's Andromach typeface from new matrices that were started by Paul Hayden Dunsing. He had also cast from newly made mats as seen in this Mexican ornament arrangement for a book by Juan Pasco. One of the additional tools that Bradley and a few other typecasters have been using is a Macintosh driven system that replaces the keyboard and tape components of the monotype. You can barely see the Mac laptop that's on top of the monotype caster behind Bradley. But most, most uh, people who are using the system seem to be using the Welliver system created by Bill Welliver. This setup at Hand and Eye Press in London gives you a quick idea of how to retrofit your monotype caster. Kind of looks like it's on some sort of life support, but in some ways it is. Uh, since we've now crossed the ocean to London, I do want to cover some of what's going on in Europe, despite the talk being billed as focusing on North America. It's really impossible not to include it, so some of what's going on in Europe currently. Patrick Gossens, based in Antwerp, Belgium, is a collector and enthusiastic student of printing and typecasting. He has over time acquired an impossibly large collection of typecasting and printing equipment. Rather than just collecting and hoarding, he's actively engaged in the latest practitioners, engaging with the latest practitioners of various skill sets to come and help instruct and get machines in working order. Nelly Gable is the last official punch cutter from the French Imprimerie Nationale. Here she's guiding Patrick on punch cutting and reciprocally, Patrick showing Nelly the, pen, the Benton pantograph engraving machine. One current resident at Goosen's Letter Kunde workshop is Yuri Florin. He's currently about 50 characters into a new font project with some consulting from Ed Rayer. A few years ago, Patrick had acquired the materials that made up the Dale Gill foundry. Dale Gill was the foundry of Theo Rahek, who had acquired a full working foundry from the remnants of the American Type Founders Company, casting and matrix cutting departments. The American Type Founders auctioned off the assets in 1993. The story of this auction of the century is recalled by Greg Walters of Pequot, Ohio. Greg had also acquired many foundry casters and many mats from the AETF auction himself. One machine acquired by Greg was known as the Giant Pivotal Caster. This frightening machine is one of a few in existence that can cast up to 144 point type. In 2014, I approached Greg about the possibility of casting 120 point cloister initials that were owned by the Cary Graphic Arts Collection in Rochester, New York. These were also purchased at the aforementioned ATF auction. When I visited Greg during the casting of these initials, I filmed them in action. You can see the short film on printingstewards.com website. Printing Stewards is a new nonprofit headed by Fritz Swanson that was set up as a planned su succession of Greg's casting equipment. Unfortunately, Greg passed away much sooner than anyone expected and the Printing Stewards have to, had to scramble to get the organization in place. This shot of a portion of Greg's shop, you can see at least nine typecasting machines out of the 74 inherited by the Printing Stewards. Please visit their website and follow along as I see this new organization as an important key to keeping typecasting alive in the US. Now, segueing back outside North America, uh, Russell Moret of Brooklyn, New York, it embarked on his hungry Dutch type made specifically for monotype composition casting using the talent and resources of the Type Archive in South London. It was announced earlier this year that the Type Archive has to move premises and may not be accessible for such projects or even research for the foreseeable future. This is not a good development. In the Netherlands, in 2016, Ronald Stewart of Type Foundry West Zone cut the two color Ziza typeface for the digital foundry Novo Typo. Um, having worked with two color types and realizing the alignment involved, this is, this is quite a technical feat. Again, exciting seeing new designs being made. Rainer Gerstenberg of Frankfurt, Germany was considered the last commercial typecaster in Europe. His collections include matrices from Stempel, Haas, Nebbiolo, and several other European foundries. He has announced his retirement and with no heirs or apprentices to continue, the foundry announced it was closing as of December 31st, 2021. 
There's still some fonts sold on his website, but these may be the last. So moving back closer to home, for me, the letter foundry of Michael and Winifred Bixler. I met Mike and Winnie Bixler in late 2014 when I was started as the director of the Wells Book Arts Center in, in Aurora, New York. Their studio in Skinny Atlas, New York is about 45 minute drive from Aurora. I would visit them about once a month while I was at Wells. I left Wells in 2019 and have since been visiting the Bixlers about every two weeks. Uh, they've been casting type for over 50 years and their collection of monotype matrices numbers over 700 fonts and hundreds, if not thousands, of ornaments. Shown here are a couple unusual faces in their collection. There's old Bulgarian at top and a Gaelic typeface below. Looking to the future, there's no clear secession plan. We all feel it's important for the collection to remain intact and ideally continue as a functioning foundry, but we currently don't have a clear idea of how that might happen. Their foundry is a living museum and their knowledge in this field is incredible. I value every visit with them and feel privileged that I can assist and learn from them. I've learned it's not easy to type cast, but I have developed a deep appreciation for all that goes into it and why it's worth preserving. One organization that was created to be a living museum is the C.C. Stern Foundry in Portland, Oregon. They're the heirs to the foundry of Christopher Stern, who was memorialized by the naming of Jim Rimmer Stern typeface. They've recently moved their operations to a more rural location, and we look forward to what they may be doing in the near future. Metal type casting has been struggling to stay alive and the revival of letterpress printing has increased demand for new metal type. But the reality is that typecasters are closing operations faster than new ones are opening. There are a few other places you can buy new metal type that I haven't mentioned yet. Uh, Mackenzie and Harris in San Francisco. This looks like their current stock. Skyline Foundry in Arizona. Pelican type foundry in Pensacola, Florida is one of the newest foundries. The community of typecasters is small, and most of the practitioners are very aware of the fragility of keeping the craft alive. To that end, pretty much every single person doing casting is more than willing to share their knowledge with those who are interested in learning more. Some may simply be fascinated by the mechanics of these machines, while others see the unique attributes in printing from metal type of which there is a finite supply. I hope this talk might inspire those fascinated with typography and complex machines to seek out a place in this field for themselves. I know there are more than a few people present who are actively involved in typecasting who I've actually mentioned in this talk, and perhaps we can open the floor to questions that I might be able to answer, or better yet, some of our esteemed colleagues in the Zoom call. I'll leave you with a few websites as a starting point for some deeper diving into what's out there. Uh, next to this lovely electrotype matrix from a photo by Dan Reynolds, which is another process other than en engraving used for making type. It, it, it's. Uh, Kind of a separate talk into itself, but it's just such a good image. We left it there. My email's at the bottom. You can contact me, ask me any questions, and get in touch. But again, the online resources, um, have a look. Uh, Printing Stewart's mentioned. Fritz also set up the where to buy new type in the US. So all the foundries that are currently casting should be listed there. Um, Securitas Root, um, it's a kind of a fantastic collection of um, just, you'll get lost in this website. Everything you ever wanted to know that's that's findable online can be found through the site. And of course, Patrick Wilson's Letter Kunde project. So I thank you for having me and let's uh, see what questions we might have. Thank you. Great, Richard, thank you very much. Um, as, as mentioned in the side, uh, if anyone has any questions uh, for Richard, please uh, please put them in the chat and we'll make sure to get, get to them right away. Uh, one thing I wanna add is, is that we will be making this talk available uh, through the LQ and YouTube channel. So uh, these links will be provided at the bottom in the about the talk. So people will be able to um, address them uh, there as well. Um, we have one question that's come in. Uh, any information to share regarding the destination of Harold Berliner's casting equipment? Um, that is something I can't specifically speak to. I, as, as, I, as I mentioned in the introduction, this is, this is sort of my personal orbit. Um, people I've encountered 
um, and I've, I've never actually um, crossed paths uh, with with Bert, uh, his his Harold or his, his daughter. So I'm not sure the exact. I'm, I know there are people on this talk who might be able to uh, answer that question. Uh, again, that's one that I'm going to blunt. Um, I, I had a, a, a thought as as you were going through the talk and 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 some of these meetings, the ATF meetings. Um, you know, this process of of casting a type, um, finding the the demand for the type uh, within within a larger context. Um, what are what are some sort of business models that you're finding are working for people that are starting out or introducing? Uh, new types into the market because it seems that there, you know, there is still, as you said, there's kind of a, a group of people you can count on one finger the ones that are still really designing them in the in in, in that kind of traditional form, but mm -hmm. there's to be sort of a, a limit in a ways. What are some unique ways you're finding? You know, obviously digital typefaces are, are one way, but what are some uh, techniques you're seeing for sort of sustainable growth of a foundry? I, th I think the key phrase that you had in that question was business model. Yeah. And that generally does not relate to most people who are doing typecasting. I believe it's more single-mindedly the process and the end result, the marketing and how to make it viable. It's, it's a real question. Um, I have some thoughts about how that, that could work. There is a demand. Um, it's getting from the source to the consumer. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something I've been trying to do on, on a limited basis. Um, because again, I think um, the, the act of keeping the art alive produces uh, a commodity, basically, or, or not, or it could just be an, an exercise in mechanics and watching these machines go. Uh, but these, these were made to produce materials that were, were a marketable commodity. Um, and I, th I think I think connecting um, people who are casting with people who want to type. Uh, again, when I started in letterpress, and a lot of people I know who do letterpress printing, they never imagined that anyone is still making type. And then to find out there is a, a pretty tight community of people who are casting, um, but not necessarily. Um, uh, even, even with uh, the, the website that, that Fritz put up, the AmericanType.org, um, there, those, these are places you can buy type, but may, maybe not all of them are um, the latest Shopify website where you can just pop a font into a uh, um, shopping cart, check out with PayPal, and then uh, two days later have your type in hand. It's, it's a much more complex process that, that is almost as old as <laughs> typecasting itself with making a personal connection with these typecasters and in some cases waiting a while um it's 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 a it's a it's from another time and so uh yeah i think i think making it a little more accessible but also making it lucrative enough for somebody who's who's making it to uh make it worthwhile did that yeah. Sort of answer the yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I have some questions that have rolled in. Sure. Uh, with the advent and popularity of photopolymer, aside from the ability to reuse metal type, what is the advantage of using metal over setting type and creating a polymer plate? Uh, and then an additional question to this is, uh, what is the difference on the page and in the look and feel of the print itself? Um, I, it's, it's, I guess it's, it's subtle, but it's also, it's profound. And I guess there's maybe an honesty, like polymer, polymer can accomplish a similar end result. Um, I think process has a lot to do with, um, the appeal, um, is sort of a connection to, uh, centuries old skill set that is, you know, uh, I, I think. And maybe Andrew might want to take a crack at this one about photopolymer. Um, and Andrew, I'll, I'll bring you up here. Yeah, I'm game. Uh, you're up. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, like they're both, I use both tools here. And, and I tend to think about photopolymer as being 
uh, indented offset, you know, because you're, you're sitting, you're using digital tools to create it. You're printing from a plate. It's just a very different process. We, you know, the difference is not only what you see in the result. It's the difference uh, in the experience for the person creating and for, and for the user. And those are kind of intangibles. I think they're both good. They're both good technologies, but they, they're just, they're not the same. There's a very different, if you're skillful, you can take uh, a digital face that's based on a metal type and you can tinker with it and get the fit to look like metal type, you know, cause they're different. Um, and, and you can probably get a pretty close imitation, but it's, it's, it's not comparable really. It's not the same, but it, it certainly has had an impact on the demand for metal type. And particularly for anyone who wants to use, uh, to create a new design or to use, you know, something more contemporary, they're, they're more likely to turn to polymer. It's just faster. It's just easier. It's just cheaper. It, it is if you have it, have uh, your own uh, plate processing in house. Um, and as Terry Chenard mentioned in the chat, you make an error in metal type, you can switch out a few characters quickly. But if you're on a polymer plate and something goes wrong, and you have to order the plate, you're you're in trouble. I I've had that personally happen to me where I I had a typo that I didn't catch, I needed to print, and I I was surprised I was able to to do a quick edit with a, with an Exacto knife and actually cut out some ten point type, and um, I don't think anyone can tell me where that is if they see the printed print, uh, correction, but I would never want to do that again. That was um, it, yeah, and. Um, and, and Fritz is answering the, in the uh, chat also. I think um, there there are just some inherent differences in them. They're two. They're they're different processes. They're related to each other. And I think a lot of people who do letterpress would would do both. Some people would never use metal type, um, but it's uh, you know that's 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 a. So Rich, what would you say like proportionally? The number of people who are carrying on casting for their own use primarily and mm. maybe their pals but you know versus those who are uh you know embarked in a more commercial enterprise where they're it may not be that shopify uh shopping cart simplicity but nonetheless they are mm. creating you know they're willing to say take an order for 50 pounds of type mm -hmm. and uh and fulfill for other people do, do you have a sense of what that ratio would be not not really no um i think places like m h and skyline have um what you might call back stock so you can order and it's sitting there whereas um i know with mike and winnie bixler it's it's more of a uh if someone has an entire book they want set keyboarded cast and shipped out, it's 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 not necessarily a quick process, and there might be some backlog of orders. So uh, there's nothing composition casting it has, it is is again a different thing than buying fonts of type. Um, there is a very uh, you know I think uh, much like comparing it to paper making. Say I mean there's a big difference between our uh, you know our artists who are making things in our in artisanal way in small batches versus say uh, Saint Armand you know, which has made its business as a, they, they make, uh, you know, high quality paper, handmade paper, but they make it at a, at a rate and at a, uh, at a cost that is uh, essentially commercial. Um, I, I think we're seeing that with the type foundries, that there's more and more people, you know, who are uh, interested in keeping these machines running, but those who are interested in doing it for the purpose of casting for others are very few. Right. Uh, it's, I mentioned uh, the Pelican type foundry. I don't know much about them, but I just thought it was interesting that someone has introduced a new foundry. And I think there's more and more people who, you know, people who would attend the, the ATF conference are people who are interested in getting their own machines. Like, again, Andrew, right behind you is your linotype. So a linotype, of course, is a little more limited. You can't fill a case full of linotype type. You just type in what you need and, you know, so let's let's just say you get inspiration. How long does it take you to heat up your machine? About an hour. Okay. So best case scenario is you could you can have metal set and cast, and in a couple hours you could have a, a quick. You could do me a business card, right, Andrew? 
oh, much better than that. I could do you a booklet. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll I'll put it in order. But but you have you have it for your own your own needs. And I think again, the three machines that I mentioned were made for that purpose. And those are probably the most obtainable machines. And it's not that everybody who is doing letterpress now is going to also do a little side casting with linotype or monotype or Ludlow. Um, but it gives you sort of an endless possibility of, of refreshing your own uh, print shop. One of the big issues, as you know, Rich, is that it requires a kind of uh, overlapping of skill sets. And we all, you and I both know a lot of people who are extraordinarily uh, good with the engineering and mechanical side of running casters, and they don't know what the hell to do with it. Like, but they'll cast a galley full of type for the amusement and then tip it back into the pot at the end of the day. And that's the that's the, where their love is, is in running the machine. And we know all kinds of people who are good printers and good designers and know what to do with type. But like, uh, you know, anything past a, any, anything past a bottle opener kind of terrifies them. Um, so, you know, finding enough people who have this overlap of skill sets is really part of the challenge. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, I, I would be curious, you know, how, how interactive the Zoom call is. I would be curious how many people on this call are letterpress printers or are even typecasters. But, um, and also I, we jumped into this, this entire presentation of making certain assumptions that people knew a certain amount about metal type and what a piece of metal type was. Um, so um, I do apologize if, if we kind of went into the weeds right away. Um, but um, anyway, are, did, are there other questions that we- I, I have a question for, actually for, this applies for both of you, is, is the topic of finding a way to pass on the skill set. You're talking about skill set, but also overlapping skill sets, which is, I think, an interesting way of approaching it. Mm -hmm. How to find that, you know, into the, into that warrants more exploration. So, you know, how do you find, how do you find young people and how do you support uh, people, you know, sticking with it and going through all of those, um, those very technical challenges that you allude to? Well, I, I think something akin to a uh, apprentice system of somebody dedicating uh, a, a good chunk of their life to learning the, the, the craft and then committing to taking it on. I think that's what, that's what some, people would hope could happen, but the reality is that that type of arrangement just most likely would, will not happen. Um, the Dale Gill Foundry is a good example there where Theo Rehack, I think, felt he had, he had a um, successors and, and, the, and the project kind of fell apart and, and um, uh, hats off to uh, Patrick Goossens for picking up the pieces literally they're, they're sitting in Belgium right now. Um, but again, rather than sitting there, Patrick is, is bringing in uh, Theo and Ed Rayer and people who, are, who, are, who know how to use the equipment and, and trying to train other people. But, but again, if, you're, if you have an 80-year-old training a 60-year-old, that, that's, that's not a very sustainable uh, bringing in a younger crowd. Um, there, are, there are health and safety safety issues involved. Um, this, this stuff is a little scary and some of it for good reason. Some of it's maybe a little overblown, you know, uh, just, just wash your hands before lunch and generally it's perfectly safe. Uh, that's an oversimplification, but uh, there, are, there are some issues. Um, um, I think, again, it, it, it takes a certain passion and, and how, do you, how do you learn passion if, if you have a, a a founder that has a classroom visit or maybe a dozen classroom visits and maybe there's one person out of out of that dozen visits who just says this is the coolest thing i've ever seen i want to do this how can you do it well it it would probably take sort of uh independent wealth to to allow it to happen it's not a lucrative career choice it's um it's a passion and but it's it's a it's a it's something that's really in danger of, of fully disappearing. There's tons and tons of equipment and just a handful of people who know how to make it work. And when, it, when, when, this, when these, this equipment is, is running and running right, it's singing, it's, it's, it's the, 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 the mechanics of it are pretty astound, astonishing. I think any, 
anybody who does coding just just sits down and watches a, a monotype caster moving they're just like how how is this even possible um so i i don't i don't really know what the answer is i think it's again just getting the word out there that that this is this is something this is uh this is uh teachable learnable um accessible yeah. if it's sought out yeah and i think discoverability becomes a a, a big part of that and in some ways you don't find the young people, the young people find you. Um, and so making sure that it's possible for people to get through the doors and get into places and see that these things exist, see them online, things like the Linotype movie, uh, there are various you know, multimedia things like that, a bit like Jim, the film about Jim, these have all been very good. Um, but it, I mean, the other thing is, I, I think we overblow the complexity of these things. I mean, compared to, you know, we're talking about a generation of kids who are not, you know, many of them are not afraid to pop apart a, a laptop and look at the motherboard and try and figure out, you know, how to how to pimp their rise, you know, make their machine run, run, uh, you know, better, you know, and so when I look at the linotype, I mean, it, it, it sure it's kind of complex, but it's a kind of complex that a, a Rube Goldberg machine is complex. It's one thing after another thing, after another thing, after another thing. And every one of those parts, it's a lever, it's a spring. Uh, it's six simple machines, you know, it's, 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 right. not, it's not complex in the same way that the digital world is complex. Mm -hmm. and, um, and if you give people permission, uh, if you if we stop telling them it's complicated, then they'll, you know, we'll embolden them to try. In some ways, um, I really like the Ludlow. I mean, the Ludlow is a, is the gateway drug because, it, like, literally, you pop the top open of that machine and everything is laid out in front of you. It's very simple. It's very safe relative to all the other machines. I, you know, and there's lots of them out there. They were in every little corner shop, you know, making calling cards and whatnot. And uh, and there's all kinds of great typefaces for them. And they're a lot, you know, they take less room, they plug into, you know, 220 power service. I mean, it, it's, you know, it's a way in. And um, we just have to, I think, continue to encourage people to try. Yeah, and I think there are more and more, uh, uh, I'm, 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 very grateful for the response of, of the, the Making Faces film, but I, I didn't set out to make, make a, a, a film. I set out to use the opportunity I had to record Jim Rimmer making uh, a typeface because I thought, wow, this, is, this, this seems pretty unique. I should go there with a video camera, and I did. Um, but I see more and more people doing things like that. Um, at the Printing Museum in North Andover, Frank Romano has been bringing in uh, Dave Seat, who is sort of the Johnny Appleseed of, of Linotype and, and, and Ludlow Repair. He, he can just tear apart a machine and put it back together. And he generally does that if somebody needs, if he's driving nearby, he'll come and fix your machine. So uh, Frank has decided it would be good to videotape him. And so there's a lot, a series of videos being made that will actually um, show you how this stuff is done. It, it's more and more is popping up on, on YouTube. So it's, it's not as arcane and, you know, hit the secret handshake guild system where only somebody who, who, who's done an eight-year apprenticeship and has earned the right to, to learn, learn the secrets. Um, so, um, we have yeah. A, we have a, that, that's, those are great entries into it. It's, it's something that I have been noticing a lot, especially during COVID, there were a lot of sessions that you could see, and especially in the book arts, List serve. There were always opportunities through various book centers, um, you know, in North America, uh, into different processes. Uh, question here: uh, How do we teach typography properly without access to typesetting metal type, or the history of printing, or the history of technology? Oh, that's a good. That's a good uh, question right there. I mean, I think that's sort of like teaching painting using Photoshop. You sort of you sort of skipped ahead in the, in the, in the book a few chapters, uh, so going back to you know the the original method and and handling type to understand typography to understand a, what a kern actually is by having it 
break off when you're trying to print and, and learning the hard way um, and, and appreciating digital so much more by actually having to um, uh, uh, set type in metal. And I've, I've had people say, wow, this is so much harder, but um, at first, sure, it's harder, but if you go back to it and then hop back on a computer, you just have a, a much more profound, deeper sense of what can be done in InDesign once you've, you've actually leaded, not leaded type. And um, it's, uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, just from an educational standpoint, I think it's very important. And it seems like more and more programs are introducing letterpress into design programs. Um, more now than maybe definitely more than 20 or 30 years ago or 40 years ago. Um, there, there is a revival. It's, it's a thing. Um, and again, this, this revival can, can fuel some interest in uh, a, a demand. And so, um, again, this is, this is, this is in an Amway where I'm going to say, hey, get into typecasting. You're going to make a lot of money. But first, we got to pay your, your initiation dues, and then I'll tell you how to do it. You know, that's, hey, wait a minute. I just came up with an idea. Okay. But I would say that, that, you know, good teaching always transcends technology, right? Like, so you, you think about a book like Carl Dare's Design with Type, which was written during the metal type era slash film type era. And yet, you know, it, to that book is an incredible guide still on, on how to do good typesetting because it doesn't dwell on, on any particular technique. It dwells on the, out, you know, the, the final result and what we see on the page on how, on how type you know, works in the culture and works in space. And, and so while it is, in, I think, inevitably beneficial anytime you can get a student to handle the materials, uh, whether they're the contemporary ones or the traditional ones, um, it's it shouldn't really be an impediment to good teaching not having access to it. Mm. Yeah, there's a comment in the chat uh, from a student that's at Carleton University in Ottawa, and you know they're involved with the art the book arts lab, which is this is a lab that's accessible as an English class to learn more about the book arts, uh, and it sort of has you engage with the process in the in the. I'm guessing through the through the lab that they have at the library there are some of the actual machines, which is you know it's a good example of that. I've been hearing of that at various universities setting up programs or having programs already set up um, that they're working on. Um, but I would say Spencer is as important as those tools in that lab are. What's most important in that program is Larry Thompson, who's running it, who's yeah. is a good teacher and is passionate, yeah. and whether he had you know, those tools or didn't have those tools, he would be capable of teaching about good typography and design because yeah. he, he knows it when he sees it and he, he you know, he's passionate. Yeah, and it also additional to that, there's, you know, Jason DeWenitz's program at the Okanagan College as well. He's, there's, uh, there's definitely people that are doing, you know, taking the time to teach these programs. Um, in terms but, of this is kind of, oh, go ahead. Richard? I was going to say, I think uh, having um, typesetting and it, it introduced to a, a program, I think, is a, a cross-disciplinary uh, approach where you have, we've had um, uh, English English majors, the poetry students who come in to, to actually set their own poems and understand limitations of line length and, and um just just composition and things they wouldn't necessarily think about when they're composing in word. Um, they just think about it in an entirely different way. It's sort of slowing down the idea of that they're building up their letters one at a time. And when their line is too long they, to just come up with a synonym that turns out to be a better word, <laughs> or maybe it just fit better. But but in, in a lot of cases, I've actually seen it happen where they the, the, the slowing down, the, the thinking, um, and also it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's a history lesson. <laughs> it's, you know, the, the entire history of, of printing, um, it, it developed it in a certain way. And that's how else would you get to really understand it? I mean, hands, this is hands-on history. So there's, 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 you know, multidiscipline is really the key word here. Um, in terms, yeah. In terms of, um, you know, is it going to replace uh, a, a, just a, typography class that avoids the computer completely and just did that 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 doesn't seem realistic 
I think, you know, if, if somebody's going to, to dive into the type world. But if you're going to have somebody who's an art director of a major agency come in and call, call, uh, call type typeset and uh, they want to do letter pressing, they, they need to be, you know, there's, there's terminology that's worth understanding and, 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 and fully um, appreciating, but also, you know, handling a piece of type. Um, it, it's just, it's a, there's a connection there. You know, you can get all misty about it, but it's it, it's important stuff. That's why I think that's why everybody who's here on the on the talk or is a member of the LQ and Society is is under, understanding a, a profound sense that there, there's more to this stuff. It's not just it's oh, it's cool. Yeah. Um. To to finish off, a, a, a question for both of you. Uh, what are some projects that you're working on at the moment, and what's inspiring you to 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 go through with these projects? within the community. Hmm. Andrew, you want to go first or you want me to go first? <laughs> Whatever you like, Rich, it's your show. Oh, uh, okay. Well, the latest thing I've been doing is is the is an entire visual identity system for uh, a, a Mexican restaurant that opened up next door to me. They opened up with no menus, no, no idea what to do. And I said, hey, you need menus. I thought here, this is this is this is my, uh, my my hustle going here. I want some free tacos. So <laughs> I basically pitched this idea, and they they kind of love what I'm doing. So I'm I'm actually doing something that is totally impractical. I'm using the materials I have, and realize that in talking with them, we're we're actually kind of doing the same thing. They're making handmade food in a very slow slow down way. It's it's not it's not fast food. And printing is not fast. Printing is, letterpress is the slow food movement of, of printing. It's it's you know that's that's a quick catchphrase there, but um, you know just this this is my neighbor and I I want to see them succeed and so I just decided to throw together something I would never do as a commercial uh, if somebody came to me and said hey I, how much would it cost to do this it's it's not very practical but I'm doing it because I really feel like I need to do this. I mean, there's there's other projects I'm doing that um, are more rarefied. Um, uh, the, 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 the book on Victor Hammer that I just finished up, it's, it's, it, was, it was done as a, a, a collaboration with Wells College Press. And the book took so long to make that nobody could afford to buy it. And so, so few, very few people will actually get to see it. So I kind of, I kind of like, you know, <laughs> practicality doesn't always come into what, what, what we do, I guess. Um, and a commercial printer would be horrified at, at what I'm saying, but I, I, um, let's go back to Andrew's, Andrew's introduction about me. That sounded really good. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Well, two, on the letterpress side, two big projects I've got underway at the moment. One is a book uh, about Gray Zeitz, who's a, a printer in, uh, in Kentucky uh, at Larkspur Press and a great friend. And it's a book called Make Ready. And uh, it what it is is an interview with Gray about the whole process of, uh, he was trained by Carolyn Homer, who would be Victor Homer's second wife. And, and uh, he was trained in that iron hand press tradition. And yet he's made his career on, you know, platen presses, Chandler and Prices, these little jobbing presses that most, you know, traditionally fine press printers would look sideways at. And, uh, and yet he does exceptional printing on it, and largely because of the way he handles make ready. He still does make ready like he's on an iron hand press. Mm. And uh, so I interviewed him about this, and then I annotated the thing because there were a lot of people, you know, from Harold Blinner straight through to, you know, <laughs> you know Joe Blumenthal the, uh, that that a lot of readers would know so I annotated the whole thing and it's all uh set and ready to print I've got uh Mike Heffer at Clawhammer Press and Fernie British Columbia doing some line of cuts for me and that's all going to come together and then the second one which is very Kegler-esque because it's all about sort of repurposing trash <laughs> and recycling is that it's a uh, uh last year I did a uh, letterpress book of Gerard uh, Manley Hopkins' 
poem by Beauty. And I thought this sonnet would work really well if it was printed in 18 line wood type in double page spreads. And, and it turned out pretty good. I thought it was an interesting uh, outcome. So that book sold out. But while I was making it, I was printing these sheets damp. And when I ever printed the second side of the sheet, these big solid areas of black would offset under the cylinder press. So I, I printed with a slip sheet that would catch that offsetting and keep the cylinder clean and keep everything tidy. Well, as a result, I have this bycatch. I have all these like sheets of crappy paper that have these extraordinary patterns on them wherever the impression of one side overlaps with the reservoir of the ink of the previous side. Mm -hmm. And so that they're nonsensical space alien looking language. Mm -hmm. and, and yet it is a full and complete expression of the poem, which must somehow be meaningful, even though I don't think it is. So. I contacted a poet friend, Christopher Patton, who's at U of T now and is involved at Massey a little bit, and uh, said, right in that, he's all into that kind of, uh, you know, found poetry stuff. And uh, so he wrote me this wonderful essay, and, and this is going to come out uh, sometime next year, uh, talking about this expression of the poem that is essentially a bycatch that's found in the trash of this process. So anyway, that's, that's an exciting project. It's just kind of odd. Mm -hmm. Well, Richard and Andrew, thank you very much for the, the introduction for Richard and, and Richard, thank you for taking the time to put together this, this talk and, and also uh, for anyone who hasn't had a chance to, to see uh, Making Faces, a, a portrait really of Jim Rimmer's process and the way he approaches um, making type, it's, it's really a unique glimpse and, and as, as chair of Alcuin Society, it's something that we we really appreciate it. It's a, it's a really important document. Um, and so it's really a, really worth having taking the time to see. Um, we're going to be continuing the, the virtual programming for next month. We will be, you know, ironing out the dates for November, but somewhat related, it'll be uh, Rod McDonald talking about the Canadian typography archives, which uh, they're putting together. So um, adjacent topic, certainly to some of the topics we're touching on tonight. As I mentioned, we'll be putting this, uh, this video online through our YouTube channel, and the links that you provided will be uh, hyperlinked uh, in the description, so people will be able to follow up on those. And uh, again, Andrew, thank you so much. Richard, thank you for taking your time. To, thank to you for having us. And, and thank you, everyone, for, uh, for attending this evening. Have a, have a great evening, and uh, talk to you soon. Yes, great. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>